Welcome to the Philips webinar, International Learning from COVID-19 Post-Webinar Discussion. Dr. Mark Elliott caught up with Professor Stefano Nava after the webinar to get his insight into the use of home ventilators in an acute setting. Stefano, sorry that you had to, to leave yesterday and, and I hope you're feeling okay now. There are just a couple of other things that I'd like to discuss with you. The first thing is really about the use of home ventilators. We're aware that this is very abnormal situation. Sometimes we're having to do things that we wouldn't normally even dream of doing, using things in a way that they weren't designed for. And I'd be really interested in your experience of using non-ICU, non-hospital ventilators, home ventilators, both for the provision of CPAP or in intubated patients. Well, I need to tell you that during wartime, all the guidelines and suggestion, uh, they basically disappear. Uh, we submit, this is interesting maybe for you to know, we submit a, a preliminary paper to a journal describing our, uh, our uh, attitude uh, with ventilation. And one of the reviewers was really asking me, oh, uh, which is your gold standard and which is the methodology that you apply to say that? Well, I think that it was obviously a good one. I don't think it was you anyhow. But well, talk about the point. I mean, miss the point that when you are hit by a tsunami, then you need to do what you can and with what you have. Uh, on my Twitter, I said, uh, I can even ventilate now a patient with a tuna can if it works. Uh, if it can deliver positive pressure. Just to say that, yes, we have used uh, home ventilators, even single tube for uh, a sick patient. That means uh, both for a non-invasive and invasive ventilation. My hospital still have uh, uh, bad availability, but uh, in uh, a lot of hospital, uh, when they need to intubate patients, they also use home care ventilator. My little experience, I need to be honest, but the large experience in other hospitals, you can also use home care ventilator, even in intubated patients, obviously inside the hospitals. Both uh, tracheotomized and not tracheotomized patient. Actually, most of the tracheotomized patients are sent to a high dependency unit sure. with, a home, uh, with a home care ventilator. Yeah, I think that's very much the way that we're thinking locally is of using the high-end proper intensive care ventilators for the initial phases. And once people are beginning to get better, um, if needed, then to switch them to a home care ventilator. Have you had any experience of using home ventilators as the first ventilator? So um, patient comes into hospital intubated straight onto a home care ventilator, or is it more the pattern I've just described? Not, not really in my experience, but I heard several hospital in which they need to do that. Okay. I was told probably it's true that in certain hospital, they need to ventilate the, patient with ambu bag. So, I mean, I think that it's better to ventilate with home care ventilator with ambu bag. So, okay. uh, this is just to say that the theory is totally different from the practice in this respect. At the end of the day, a ventilator is a ventilator. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so what about non-invasive CPAP? So, you, yeah. using a home care machine? A ventilator or no, even a home care CPAP? We only use a, a CPAP. We, so far, we did not use home care ventilator or sleep CPAP, I call. We only use CPAP either with uh, the dedicated system like uh, the helmet, as yeah. I repeatedly discussed, or with a Boussignac mask, or uh, like the standalone uh, mask CPAP. Mm -hmm. No, never with uh, a, a home care ventilators. We, we, we have we, level up of uh, uh, small CPAP device, so we don't uh, we, okay. we reserve home care ventilator for uh, 
bi-level ventilation. Because um, we, we've started to explore this and, and uh, we're still in the very early stages of this, but it just looks as if it might be possible and that we might be able to get a reasonably high FiO2, which is obviously the big concern with these devices used in yeah. that way. That's really helpful. Um, perhaps just to move on to the whole question of CPAP. Um, you've got a lot of patients on CPAP in Italy and Chinese data that was presented suggests that a very significant proportion of our patients can be managed successfully using either CPAP, high flow or bi-level ventilation. I don't know whether that is still true in that the phenotype of the disease that we're seeing has possibly changed as we discussed in the first webinar or whether things that that is still the situation and I suppose that there are two categories of patients. There's the patient who is on CPAP, who would be for escalation to intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, I'd be interested in to know very roughly what proportion of patients avoid intubation because they are managed with CPAP. A secondary question would be those who are first treated with CPAP, do they have a worse prognosis when they get intubated? looking at what we were discussing about possibly potentiating lung injury through patient, inju patient effort, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third group is the patients who are not for intubation, for whom CPAP is the ceiling of care. Is there any way that we can identify the patients who are going to die, sadly, with CPAP so that they can avoid unnecessary suffering and that we can avoid exposing staff to unnecessary risk by just carrying on with something that is futile? As I said since the beginning, my answer is mainly a sort of gut feeling like instead of evidence-based, obviously. I think we collect a dozen and dozen of data, but we obviously did not have the time to analyze. So my feeling is that 40% of the patient uh, in which we start CPAP, they respond. That means that they get better, uh, they, can, uh, see, they can have CPAP removed, and this is what more or less I said during the first uh, uh, webinar. Sorry, how, how long do they have to remain on CPAP for that group? Okay, uh, depends, but usually they stay for uh, between two and five days. The problem is that the more and more I see patient, or I was seeing patient because now I'm, I'm home, but I got update every day. I think that most of these patients could have been managed also with oxygen, with the same rate of success, probably, probably. So I'm not sure that uh, it, it is CPAP that make the trick, but is uh, the nature and the phenotype of the patient, probably. Clearly, there are patients that respond very well, and uh, we put a time limit around four, six hours, and then weaning off uh, CPAP is relatively easy. Uh, some patients, they recover very fast. Some other they do not, and therefore we, uh, as I said, we need to switch to intubation. Mm -hmm. Well, are those patients worst? Uh, they are doing worst. The patient who initially responded to CPAP and then they fail after they were intubated. Well, physiologically, as explained by Paolo Pelosi, the answer is probably yes because I remind to all of you that CPAP does not provide a form of inspiratory support and therefore does not release the muscle effort. So these patients sometimes they breathe very hard and asking them to stay on CPAP for a long period of time may induce self-induced lung injury probably. So it makes sense that this patient may can deteriorate, but uh, once more, uh, it's still too early to say that we have definitely proved that these patients are doing worse because they stay for, I don't know, three or four days on CPAP before being intubated. So it is possible, but uh, once more, here is not evidence-based. Since one week, I changed my mind on a lot of conclusions that I draw uh, 10 days ago. So, 
Okay. No, well, I think that we all understand that we're not going to have evidence and therefore um, frontline up-to-date experience is absolutely the only thing that we have available and, and, and the best, which is some of the merit of webinars like this. Just to go back to what you said about the patients you think, and I appreciate it is only think and it's an impression, could have been managed just with oxygen. I'm getting now two slightly different and diverging views on this. One is that we ought to be starting CPAP earlier because of reducing the risk of self-inflicted lung injury, self-induced lung injury. On the other hand, that actually these patients may not need CPAP at all. So what sort of criteria do you think that we should be looking at for moving from <clears throat> oxygen to CPAP? Now, we, in the last few days, we do like this. If a patient has uh, like um, posterior uh, pneumonia, mainly localized in the posterior part, and we prone them with oxygen and they ameliorate, we don't care about CPAP. We keep going with either uh, uh, oxygen or high flow nasal cannula, whatever. Uh, the simple test of pronation, I mean, that is not, uh, I want to be clear, uh, yeah. pronation in the ICU. Yeah. It's just asking patients to, 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 to be prone as much as they can with the oxygen. Yeah. And sometimes you see dramatic improvement. So in this patient, I think it's totally useless to provide CPAP. Uh, yeah. If this test is negative, we now start CPAP and we see, we gave them four, six hours to see if they improve or not. Okay, so I think that you've been, you very aggressively CT scan everybody, and I think that quite a lot of others either don't do that because they don't have the capacity to it, um, or because there are concerns about infection spreading and so on. Would it be reasonable if you're not going to CT just to do a simple trial of proning, that you turn people onto their front and see what happens to their oxygen? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but, and I mean, how quickly would you see that response? Within minutes? With it minutes, it's almost, yeah, okay. we do that in patient with predominant posterior lesion uh, because otherwise yeah. pronation uh, does not mean but, nothing. Okay, but if you, if you haven't got a CT scan, you're not going to know whether it's, yeah, but if you... A matter of minutes, one guy from 82% uh, uh, can go up to 98. 98. Okay. That's really, really helpful, thank you. Which group are we on to now? Are we on to the ones who are not going to go to ICU? Not for yeah. intubation. Yeah. What do you think about those? So group three. You know, the problem is here, you need to, it, it's difficult to get predictors. It is clear that is the patient has very high uh, level of, uh, for example, d dimer is a good indication of poor outcome, for example, because it means that uh, there is a coagulation problem. If the, if the patient is very obese, is is very old, and it does not improve, it is very likely that they will not also respond to endotracheal intubation. So here is a sort of, uh, of drama because usually this patient in uh, the normal situation could be easily admitted to the ICU. Sometimes uh, in this day, is it difficult to find ICU beds? I think that we are lucky enough because we now have a palliative care service that is deeply involved in the counseling of us in both uh, directions. The first one is to try to uh, release uh, dyspnea when oxygen, CPAP or whatever is not able to do that. To sedate uh, eventually deeply the patient if needed. And last but not least, uh, we face an extremely peculiar situation here. Usually you can discuss with the patient or end or with the relatives, this issue. Everything here is totally different because uh, relatives are not allowed to come to the hospitals. Uh, actually, in some hospitals, there is police outside. They don't allow you to enter. So all the communication need to be performed 
uh, by phone. And the palliative care service is helping us a lot to do that. To update the relatives uh, with the condition of a patient and also to try to understand what is uh, or where the life uh, willing uh, of, uh, of the patient when the patient is not competent any longer. So it's a very complex uh, moment now because we need to do everything not face to by face but the palliative care service is really helping us uh, uh, in uh, approaching these uh, terrible moments so i think everyone should consider having a palliative care service uh, uh, for this disease that's really helpful that's certainly something that we're putting in very strongly locally so so the patient who is on cpap who is holding their own who is not for intubation and all they're doing is holding their own they're not getting any better they're not getting any worse do the, what hap, do those patients pull through eventually or do they pull through and, and put them on oxygen and see and try to maybe reduce dyspnea if they have yeah. you know some of them they could still recover i mean uh, Human nature is impressive sometimes. Not in my hospital, but in the hospital next door, one guy that was 103 years old could manage to survive without intubation. He was on CPAP, they removed CPAP, they put on oxygen, and he was discharged, uh, I read on the newspaper yesterday. So, Fantastic. not a matter of age, it's, it's a matter sometimes of nature of our response to disease, uh, your previous uh, uh, medical situation. I'm scared in, uh, in, uh, in uh, listening some webinar when people, uh, they claim they have a recipe, they discover uh, everything, but uh, it's still a big mystery. I guess it was ever thus with every aspect of, of this field of medicine, of the patient who you think is not going to pull through the night to the next morning is having breakfast and the day after goes home. It's extremely difficult. Um, Stefano, one last very quick thing just to deal with because a lot of people are making inquiries about this. Is there any role at all for the for cough assist devices in this disease? So far, to be honest, we did not use. And in the patient we extubated, usually the best predictors of extubation is asking the patient cough with a tube. If they cough well, you remove the tube and let's see. But usually they have, a, at least intubated patient, they have a quite uh, uh, effective cough. I still not see many patient with uh, a cough problem and thick secretion as uh, stated by uh, a lot of colleagues. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it's by chance uh, or not. But I also spoke with colleagues in my hospital, in the other ICU, in other hospitals. Mm, some of them reported, reported a very thick uh, secretion. But uh, to be honest, when we extubate and we ask patients to cough, they remove a lot of secretion. But they are not like uh, uh, gum or something like that. They are fluid secretion. So, so they, they can clear them themselves. Clear. They can clear. I mean, especially the younger people with not pre existing disease, they're doing well. Okay, that's really helpful. And then I've just thought of one other thing, just to again, just to, to re explore, uh, because again, there was a little bit of differences of opinion yesterday. High flow nasal cannulae. In Spain, they seem to be using them more. What's happening in Italy now? As we said, our major, major concern is uh, the consumption of oxygen. I mean, uh, it's. Uh, Depending on, uh, on your uh, uh, deposit of oxygen, but uh, usually they consume a lot, a lot of uh, oxygen. So theoretically, uh, we perform the test, proning test, uh, mainly with high flow. Most of the patients on oxygen are not on high flow, are either on reservoir or uh, venturi. Uh, those on oxygen, eh? partly because uh, easy of use. And partly because uh, in Bergamo, they are consuming. Uh, it's not a joke. 
8,000 liter per minute of oxygen. Per minute. Oh, per minute, wow. Yeah. So, you need to be careful. In Cremona, more or less where I was born, Mark, as you know, they built up a new oxygen station because with the usual one, they could not uh, stand uh, the demand. Stefano, thanks very much for um, those very helpful insights and you continue to get well soon. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you.